stay with the text, don't get out of the text, stay right there with it, and that's what you're going to preach. But I'm not going to do that this morning. Because all of them talk about this idea of perfection in some way or another. So I would ask you this morning, you know, that as you think about this theme of holiness, perfection, to describe what your idea of perfection is. That when you think about true perfection, is it, uh, you know, what is it that, that you know of or, or can, can talk about that needs absolutely no improvement? That cannot be improved no matter what you do to it. It is just what it is. It's, it's perfect. So I thought I'd, you know, that we try a couple of things, you know, to say, you know, that what some people think. Some people think that's perfection. That it, you can't do any better than that. That he has captured the essence of her in this picture. And I thought, when I thought about images for perfection, tr truthfully, this is one of the ones that came to mind. This was another one that came to mind. God's perfection in nature, what God makes that we can't make. I don't think that if we tried that we could probably go out and create a flower, maybe with genetics being what it is. But I'm just saying that in creation, in the way of nature, in the way that God puts beauty in front of us, there are times that we just look at it and say, that's perfect. You can't improve on that. It doesn't get any better. And then there's other things that, you know, that we create sometimes that, that we think about as what might be perfect. <laughs> this was my other choice. <laughs> so you've heard, it, you've heard it said that 90 feet between the bases is, is a perfect distance. That if it was anything different than 90 feet exactly, it just wouldn't be the same game. That it has to be that way. Now I gotta say that last night after I did this, this talk in last night's service, and we were having fellowship hour back there, and there was a gentleman who, who I was introduced to, and she's and the, and the, uh, we were talking, and she says, his his wife said, you guys have a connection. He showed a picture of a baseball diamond out there, and, and talked about 90 feet between the bases, and he kind of he just looks at me and said, well, did you tell them that there's 108 stitches on a baseball? <laughs> I said, no, no, I, I didn't tell them that. Well, you know how far it is from home plate to second base, don't you? I said 90 feet uh, squared plus 90 feet squared, the square root of that. I have no idea how far it is. It's 127 feet, uh, five, five, eight, 5 and 3 eighths inch. I thought everybody knew that. <laughs> and then I'm thinking perfection. He's sitting next to me. The text this morning talk about human perfection. God's perfection. We sing holiness, and I, said, I picked out that hymn intentionally because to sing it because this is the way that we normally think about holiness. Only God is holy. Only Jesus is holy. But then we, we read the text that, in Leviticus that the first thing that God says as the Israelites are getting ready to go into this and occupy the promised land is... Gather them all together and say to the congregation, you shall be holy because I am holy. And we can kind of dismiss that a little bit and say, well, that was then, this is now, and he was talking to them, he wasn't talking to us. But then Jesus is talking to his disciples, the disciples that are ushering in the new covenant, and says, he just changes the word a little bit. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a tough challenge, wouldn't you say? I mean, we, well, how do we think of ourselves? I mean, we think of ourselves a lot of times. If I was asked to ask you, when is the last time you looked in the mirror and said, now that is one holy person right there. <laughs> we laugh, but we should. We should. Because I believe that everybody here falls under that category as the body of believers, those who are being sanctified, John Wesley's word, that we're on this, this path that leads to perfection in the sanctifying process, that we have a goal in mind that we will be made perfect. That in this lifetime, the opportunity is for us to be perfect in love with Christ. 
And the bookend that, that God sets out at the very beginning to be perfect as I am perfect, to be holy as I am holy. And the other end of that, on, on the very end of the scripture was to love your neighbor as yourself is the framework for living. That if you set yourself on the path of holiness and when you arrive, you have loved your neighbor as yourself, you have sanctified yourself. You have made yourself perfect in love with God because you have loved your neighbor as yourself. That's a tough challenge right there. That's a very tough challenge because everybody knows you can't give away and you can't do what you don't have. And I thought of this, that some of the, one of the problems that we have today is that we can't give away that love because maybe we don't love ourselves enough. That may be next week's sermon. You might have to go there. In the Matthew text, to be perfect. And Jesus takes this idea of perfection. And in both instances, in Leviticus and in Matthew, we get examples of what perfection or holiness or sanctification or whatever you want to call it, what that looks like. And in Leviticus, it looks like social justice. And more than social justice, because it looks like ethical law. And it also looks like love of self. So we've got a lot of going on right there, and the groups of people that, that are involved in your loving up your neighbor, unless we should say, well, who is our neighbor? Read the text again. The alien that's, that's in your country because you were once an alien. The poor, the blind, the deaf, your neighbor, those who have, those who are afflicted, the sick, those who work for you, the laborer. I think he pretty much, if we go back and look at this, he's covered all the bases of who your neighbor is, so we don't have to ask that rhetorical question, you know, who's my neighbor? Thinking that we can get out of that, you can't. It's been answered for you. And in Jesus in the Matthew text, it's even more important. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Where'd that come from? See, that's not written in the Bible. But Jesus knows you've heard it said. Because what we do is we proof text the Bible and all the people are saying that this is what the Bible says. And Jesus is saying, no, you've heard it said. Six times Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say. It's because we have not taken the word of God and applied it to our life the way that we should have. Probably, probably, well, let's talk about sanctification a little bit first. John Wesley's word for perfection for, is sanctification. And John, uh, in, in our Wesleyan tradition, that we believe justification, which is that time we were made right with God, and sanctification happens at the same time, but justification is an immediate result, and sanctification, although it can be, usually takes a while to get there. Usually it's a road that we travel. Usually it's a road that... that could be a short road, could be a long road. It depends on how much time it takes to, for God to perfect us in life. And unless we think any differently, that our justification and sanctification is just like our faith. It's a gift. God grants us that. The moment that we believe, God grants us that. So it's this turning to God, turning to Jesus, that allows you to be sanctified, that allows you to start down this journey, this pathway we call sanct uh, perfection or holiness or sanctification. It doesn't matter. It's called loving your neighbor because that's the end result is love your neighbor, love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when you get there, you've arrived. But there's a problem along the way in the process because we're human. And humans like to do things differently than what God does. God sets out the format. Here's your, here's your blueprint. Here's your outline. Here's your guidebook. And Jesus picks it up and says, after a thousand years, you've kind of gotten away from your guidebook. So let me reinterpret it a little bit for what it really means. And so he just takes the scriptures and says, let me tell you what the root causes of those things that you're not to do. 
because I want to tell you that if you think adultery is the problem, perhaps the problem is the way that you look at another woman. If you think that turning the other, that uh, you should love your neighbor and, and uh, hate your enemies, you know, that you're going to have to ask yourself, where did that come from? Because it is not scriptural. We live in a time right now that the problem that, that we're trying to address is the downturn of Christianity for a generation that follows the bulk of us because we are the boomer generation or beyond that and the generation that follows us is Generation X, Millennials, whatever you want to call them. It's that group of people that was born between 1980 and 2000 that have a voice that have a big voice. You know why? Because they outnumber the boomers. And not only that, they're more educated than the boomers. Four out of ten expect to have a college degree where for boomers it was less than two out of ten. And so we have to start paying attention as to the church as to why our seats are empty when we've got this blueprint, this guideline, this idea for sanctification, for holiness, and living in lives in relationship to others, where did we go wrong? Why aren't they here? Why don't they love us? And why does religion and spirituality fall so far down on their list of priorities that when they start listing things that are important to them, religion and spirituality is number six. And think about the things that you can think of that are one through five. And we've got to ask ourselves, why isn't six up there? Gen Xers, millenn millennialist, millennialist. <laughs> I like Gen Xers better. <laughs> What's important to them? Relationships. Relationships with each other. And to that end, I'll spend 17 hours a week on the computer at their job and 17 hours a week on the computer personal time. Almost one, uh, almost a third of their life will be spent looking at a computer screen or looking at, a, uh, we can call our smartphones computers now anyway. The basic method of communication is texting. They, they embrace technology more than any other generation. It's a generation of people who, who will never know what it's like not to have a cell phone. But they don't want us to build them the greatest technology and to say, look at what we've done for you. Come on in and see our new TV screens. Or look at this room that we built for you down here that's just for you. Go there and see what you can learn about God. They want to engage with you. They want to be part of what you do. They want to be in relationship with you because the number one thing that they wanted that said that what motivates millennials? Relationships. Relationships. And they think differently than us. Part of it probably is because to them the world is small. The world is very small. Anything they want to know about the world, it's at their fingertips. And for us it's always been over there. And for them, they think no differently talking about their neighbor who may be in Ghana than they do the one that lives across town or across the street. But their relationships are so important to them. And they don't, it's not that they don't want to be with us. They don't necessarily think that we know how to relate to each other. That on our quest for holiness, somehow we've misstepped. And things that are important and meaningful to us just aren't that important to them. Just aren't that important. They are, what's interesting, strong on family. Millennials expect to be married at least once, and they believe that they will be married for a lifetime if they choose to get married. They're just not that, they're different from the bulk of us in that they think that the right to marry, the person that's getting married, the response, uh, idea of what's right and wrong, it's not ours. 
60% when interviewed said that they felt that it was up to the individual as to who their life partner was. 40% said they strongly feel that way. And keep in mind that this is a generation that's replacing us, that want to engage you in dialogue, that want to engage you in conversation, that want to be in a relationship with you, but want you to absolutely hear what they have to say on issues. Not to change your mind, but for understanding so that you know where they're coming from and they know where you're coming from because they love all ideas. Like I said, they're educated, very educated. They want to know stuff. They want a relationship with Christ. They don't want a big Sunday school room. That's not what they're interested in. They're interested in a meaningful relationship and when they look at you, they want to see what has your relationship with God done for you? Tell me what that means to you. Tell me what that means to be a, a child of God that's going to transform the world, that God will use us because we deserve to be loved and appreciated because we are a child of God. Tell me what that's done for you lately. Tell me how that works in your life. It's not the idea of the, the conversation this morning is not so that we can fill this church up with 20 and 30 somethings. That's not the idea. We look at our demographics and we're probably just not geared to that. But when we do see young people that are in, in, in where our places that we go to, and when we see where they're at, we recognize the fact that they may be different than us and think differently than us, and their world is different than us, and their threat level is different from ours, and their understanding about what it means to be an, an American may be different from ours, simply because of the globalness of the way they conduct business right now. But they want to know that they, you don't have to be afraid of them. They want to know that when they do come into your house of worship, that you will offer them something substantial. That you will also offer them something of substance. That God in your life will be so meaningful that they will be able to see it from the time that they come in the door. Because if you don't, they will never come in the door. They'll come in the door to go out that door. It's so important. Jesus took the text. And he didn't proof text it. He didn't say, well, let me tell you what this really means. You know, I take one text. He expounded on it and said, let's get to the root of the cause of the problem. And he takes Levitical law and applies it to something two, a, a thousand years later to the life of, of the, the uh, Christians that's in Jerusalem. He understands that they're not the same people that are exiting Egypt and headed for the promised land. Times have changed. And it's not that the law is any different than it is right now, different for them than it was for us. It's just that it, we have to apply it in cultural context. And if we don't, then it'll never be meaningful to anybody. It'll always be that well, that was then and this is now. That applied to them, it doesn't apply to us. And we can't put ourselves on the outside. Jesus said, I come to fulfill the law, not to do away with it. So as we start thinking about our church, and as we start thinking about this congregation and its meaningfulness in, into the community and into the world and into the area that we sit in, into all those different contexts that we should be, we should always be able to relate to anyone and demonstrate this love of Christ that we got that we have so deeply within us how that's working for us how that is showing doing causing us to negotiate in the world and how this makes me want to be in relationship with you and you and you and everybody here because we're all part of the same family it's going to be a challenge it's going to be a challenge. For us, you know, this road to perfection, this road to holiness, like I said, it's a goal. It's a, it's a, it's, uh, the word for perfection comes from the Greek word telos, which is the same as goal. So we have this goal of perfection, of loving our neighbor as ourselves, and loving God with all of our heart, mind, strength, and soul. If we put our mind on that alone, then what, what, just think of what we could accomplish. Just think of it. 
I hope that this, this idea of, of being perfect and being sanctified and being made uh, holy in Christ, it shouldn't scare you. It should give a new spring to your step. It should give you an, an understanding of what God expects out of you and what you can expect from God along the way. That as we come together in Christian love, our relationships will be strengthened. And one thing that we do know, that at the end of the day, when this life is run, you, only, you, know, you can have all the stuff you want. But if you don't have relationships with other people, then you've missed the mark on being holy. Thanks be to God.